What we talk about is overcoming the big D. That big D stands for denial or the idea that violence cannot happen in our workplace. And if we have that mentality, that's very negligent men mentality, uh, we, we really can't do anything to increase safety and security or to increase our preparedness related to violence. So uh, we overcome the big D. The next is, uh, wh what can we do from a access control point of view within our workplace? And when we talk about access control, not only are we talking about how people, uh, visitors, the public, even our coworkers, uh, and, and different people have access into different parts of our facilities, but we also talk about a, having a visitor management process as well. And then when we talk about intruder response, the next thing we want to talk about is, have, do we have a policy on intruder response and have we provided training for our, for our folks and our people if, God forbid, the worst case scenario does occur? And identifying safe rooms within our facility is an important part of that process of developing a policy and uh, increasing our preparedness. The single biggest step a business can take to increase safety and security of their workplace is to train their employees. That's a trained employee is the single biggest step to increasing security. So we would really recommend providing training to their employees, not only on the response phase, but also the prevention phase, which would be how to recognize body language or behavioral indicators, particularly if it's a coworker that's on a downhill path. Very rarely are those sudden impulsive acts. So we want to teach people what to look for so we can help those employees that are struggling maybe with day-to-day -day life uh, issues going on at home, uh, stressors in other parts of their life. Uh, we can get them plugged in with human resources and employee assistance programs. We try to put those into two categories. The first are the direct costs, the dollars and cents it's going to cost an organization. Not only uh, when we talk about uh, mitigating an event afterwards, uh, getting assistance, uh, counseling for employees, things of that nature. But uh, when it turns into litigation, because maybe there's a perception that we were not prepared. So, so, so those are some of the direct costs. Those direct costs add up quickly. Just to defend a, uh, a lawsuit is averages about $800,000 just to defend it. Uh, we do know that you're less likely to be sued if there's a perception based on the plaintiff's lawyer thinking, yeah, they were prepared, they had a policy in place, they had trained employees. My chances of winning this lawsuit aren't going to be nearly as likely, so it, that will reduce the likelihood of a lawsuit. Now the indirect costs are things like, now we have the wrong kind of PR. We are known for all the wrong reasons. If you think about names like Sandy Hook and Columbine and uh, San Bernardino Massacre in, in the Excel industry, some of those locations, now they are known and your location or your brand is now known for all the wrong reasons and now you're perceived when people drive by or when they go, come to your website, they're like, oh yeah, that's where such and such happened. And we're known for all the wrong reasons at that point. Very rarely are these sudden impulsive acts. People that commit these acts, uh, statistically, uh, co-workers, disgruntled uh, former workers, former employees that work there are one of the leading causes. Very rarely is that sudden impulsive. There's usually, uh, after, the, after the incident, everybody becomes an expert. Co-workers become experts. They're like, oh yeah, I thought there was something strange going on with that person, or this person had always mentioned A, B, or C, and I'd seen something on social media that they had posted, and it kind of made me feel uneasy. I really wish I would have said that something. Uh, of course, other risks of violence are strangers that could commit. If you're uh, part of a workplace, maybe uh, it's a convenience store that you work at. That's a, that's a high-risk environment as well for workplace violence by strangers. Uh, healthcare industry is one of the leading locations for, for violence. Uh, nurses, for example, uh, about one in four nurses report being assaulted uh, once at least in the last two years alone. So statistically, healthcare and some of the motivators for healthcare are you have drug seekers that come there, you have families and people that are in crisis that are being treated there. And so we know this, when emotions are high, logic is low, and sometimes behavior can degrade as, as a result. Well, we know suicides increased dramatically over four times from 2015, from 62 to over 280 uh, suicides in the workplace. The thing about suicides that we need to be aware of, even though they harm themselves only, anytime somebody's a danger to themselves, that automatically makes them a danger to others. So suicides that take place at our workplace, we can, we can put those in the category of workplace violence or at least potential or risk of workplace violence as well. And we also know based on our current epidemic in the opioid 
addiction, we, that we're seeing a massive increase of overdoses that take place at the workplace as well. We know people that are suffering from addictions, uh, they're, they're making decisions motivated by things out of their control, which could also increase risk of workplace violence as well. Many employers have employee assistance programs that, that can help uh, employees that are, need counseling, things of that nature, or, or they maybe, maybe need treatment related to addiction. There's insurance, many insurance plans cover this type of treatment. But we can't get them uh, into these sorts of assistance programs unless we're able to recognize what the behavioral indicators are, Maybe there, there's a, a, a sudden change in their attendance or their behavior. Uh, so how we identify those behavioral changes is we set the standard or we identify the standard by saying what is the normal behavior and body language of this particular employee. Uh, over the last couple weeks or last few months, we've seen a significant change in that behavior. So there's got to be a reason for that. So that's why we want to try to identify what are some of the stressors or the, the reasons that behavior is changing and then we can get them the proper assistance that they need. Stratagos, we can assist companies in a, in a lot of different phases. The first is the prevention phase. That's where we're going to help you put together, for instance, a high-risk termination policy. How is it that we can identify with objective criteria that this is going to be a high-risk termination that we're going to uh, partake in? And then also teaching them how to uh, conduct that, that termination in a way that's safe for not only the person affected uh, and helps them land softly uh, on, onto their next phase in life, but also the employees and the leadership that are there as well. We can assist organizations with not only protective services, we have protection specialists uh, that can be present during this process or from a consulting uh, portion, we can assist them on uh, identifying a process on how they can conduct that particular termination. Well, we put policies in place that educate people. Maybe we have a handout. Uh, maybe we have a, a, a tabletop exercise that's done by uh, department leaders. We can train them on how to uh, apply that. We have online courses and DVD courses related to intruder response as well that we can assist through our prevalent virtual intruder response program. We can assist the organization in training their employees as well. Uh, and they can either take it in a DVD uh, group format, small group format, or an e-learning format on a computer.